First Chronicles 21, I'd like to begin reading in verse number 14. We'll read several verses of Scripture together and then give you the context of where we are at in our Bible. But let's just jump in verse number 14. The Bible said, So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel, and there fell of Israel 70,000 men. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil, and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a, a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people that they should be plagued. David's finding out a real important lesson in life, and that is sometimes your sin does not just affect you. Sometimes your disobedience affects those around you as well. Uh, Mom and Daddy, your disobedience to God doesn't just carry ramifications on your life. It can carry harmful ramifications on your children's life tonight. And that's what David's finding out here. Verse number 18, Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Ornan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price, that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Ornan said unto David, Take it to thee, and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. And lo, I give thee the oxen also for burnt offerings and the threshing instruments for wood and the wheat for the meat offering. I love what Ornan says at the end of verse 23. I want you to see it. Don't miss it tonight. Ornan says, I give it all. And King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it for the full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. I want you to notice verse number 23 with me. Ornan says at the beginning of the verse, he tells David, take it to thee. He says in the middle of verse 23, Lo, I give thee. And he gets so carried away with this proposition of letting everything go that he says at the end of verse 23, I give it all. Tonight I would like to preach on the subject to your heart on I surrender all. I surrender all. If I can be seated tonight, here we find in our story that David has gotten on the wrong side of the Lord tonight. The reason why David has gotten and drawn the anger of the Lord in his life and on Israel is because David has got it in his mind that he wants to number his armies. He wants to number the people. Now David's not doing this like he did it in other times, younger in his days, to simply see how many military men he's got so that way he can go fight his battles or his wars. He's not even doing it like they did when they came up out of the land of Egypt back in the book of Numbers. David has more military men than any army in the world at this time could possibly hope to conquer him with. David's not doing this for strategic purposes, Brother Daniel. David is simply doing this so he can stick his fingers in his proverbial suspender straps, poke his chest out and say, look what I got. I got something ain't nobody else got. It is the sin of pride. God hates the sin of pride. It stinks and reeks in the nostrils of God. 
The reason why God loved David so much, I believe, is because David stayed little in his own sight for most of his ministry, and God stayed big in David's sight. This is one of the unfortunate times in David's life where he becomes too big for his own britches, and God has to put him in his place. And we find that the servant of God comes, and he says, David, the Lord's upset. And God's going to let you pick your own poison, David. God's going to let you choose what it is that he does to you. What do you want? You want famine, you want the sword, you want pestilence. You choose, and God will let you pick what happens to you. And I like what David says. David said, I'm not going to choose. He said, let me now fall into the hands of the Lord, for great is his mercies upon us. Can I say this tonight at the onset of the message? Falling ain't so bad. It just depends on where you land. David said, I'm falling, but I'm going to fall in the right spot. I'm going to fall into the hands of the Lord tonight. Hey, falling ain't so bad. It just depends on where you land this evening. Make sure if you do fall, some people fall and they fall out of church. Some people fall, they fall out of their Bible. Some people fall, they fall out their prayer closet. If you're going to fall, make sure you fall into the Lord and not away from the Lord tonight. And here in the text we find the Lord starts destroying. Seventy thousand men pay the price for David's sin. These not really the character I'm keying in on tonight. It's this little unknown character that enters the story. He may be little known to you tonight by the time the message is over that we are all well acquainted with this man called Ornan the Jebusite. He's only mentioned three times in the King James Bible. He's mentioned over in 2 Samuel 23 where the story is replicated. Over there he is called Arona the Jebusite. He's mentioned here in First Chronicles 21 and he's mentioned in one more verse of Scripture tonight. This man enters the story stage right and he is really what changes the narrative of the entire story. He shows up and he's not looking to get nothing. He's looking to give something tonight. This man shows up. He's not asking for anything. He's not wanting anything. He's just wanting to give everything he's got so the presence of God can once again and land on his people so the power of God can once again stay in this place and the judgment of God can be diverted. Can I say he stands this evening as a picture, as a symbol, as a representative of what every blood-bought child of God in the building tonight should desire their life to be. And that is a life that says, God, I give it all to you. Lord, I surrender it all to you. Everything I've got, it's all yours tonight. My life, my dreams, my hopes, my future, my car, my cash, my clothes, my career, my wife, my husband, my children, everything I am. God, it's all yours. You can have it. Be glorified in every facet of my life tonight. I like what Ornan does, Preacher Foster. Ornan shows up and he says, King, I ain't got much to give. I just got a little piece of dirt. But if you want my piece of dirt, you can have my piece of dirt tonight. It ain't much. It's just a little threshing floor. But king, if you want my piece of dirt, it's all yours tonight. Can I remind you, that's all you've got? That's all I've got? I, they sung it last night. We're just a speck of dust. We ain't nothing but dirt tonight. You look at that old dust ball. The Bible said man was formed from the dirt and the dust of the ground tonight. Don't get too haughty about who or what you think you are this evening. I mean, the truth is you ain't nothing but dirt. You come from the dirt, you're going back to the dirt one day if Jesus don't come get us out of here. So, somebody said one time that they, they weighed out a normal average man's body weight about 170 pounds and, and then weighed that out in dirt. How much money would uh, about 170 pounds worth of dirt be? And it ain't but about worth 16 or 17 cent. <laughs> you ain't worth about 16, 17 cent tonight. You realize the dress you wear wearing sister is worth more than what's in it tonight? The shoes that's on your feet brother is worth more than the feet that's in them but yet there's a God in heaven that looks down at this little a bit of dirt and he says I want that and I value that and I gave everything for that and that's really what I want tonight. I like Ornan. He doesn't just say, he doesn't just say king you can have my dirt. He says king you can have everything that comes across my dirt tonight too. Here in the text he didn't just give him the dirt. He said I give you the oxen. I give you the, the, the threshing instruments uh, the wood, the wheat. He said everything that's on my piece of dirt you can have that too. You 
you see a lot of Christians say things like this oh I want the Lord to have my life and use my life he can have it but when it gets really down cutting the rubber where it meets the road does he have everything that's on your dirt too does he have the music you listen to does he have does he have the friends you hang out with does he have the clothes you wear does he have your wallet does he have your checkbook I mean he don't just want your dirt he wants everything that lands on your piece of dirt tonight he wants it all this evening I read the story some time ago. They said at the end of World War II in the Pacific Theater, General Douglas MacArthur had, uh, had uh, they dropped them two A-bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the Japanese Imperial Army was surrendering unconditionally and they said they met on board the deck of a battleship when they met on that deck of the battleship to sign those documents of surrender one of those Japanese generals walked up and stuck his hand out to General MacArthur to shake it in a symbol of gesture of friendship and fellowship they said General MacArthur stuck his hands behind his back and would not shake the man's hand the man kind of was indignant he was a general in the Japanese Imperial Army and he asked through an interpreter why will the general not shake my hand and General MacArthur spoke something to the interpreter that then said it back to the general and he said sir the general will not shake your hand as long as your sword is still by your side he still had his saber his instrument of war at his side he said sir you give your saber up the general will gladly shake your hand and that general he unhooked his belt handed the subordinate his sword stuck his hand out and the general grasped it in fellowship and friendship you see the problem with a lot of God's people is this they want the hand of God on their life they want the touch of God on their life but they're unwilling to give something up Lord I want your hand blessing I want your hand of friendship I want your hand of fellowship but God you can't have this tonight God I'm not willing to give that up may I say the Lord doesn't deal in conditions of surrender he only deals in unconditional surrender you don't make the conditions he makes the conditions you just give it all to him and he's a good God and he sets the terms tonight too many Christians have surrendered hell for heaven but they have not surrendered earth for heaven a lot of Christians gave up hell for heaven who wouldn't want to give up hell for heaven everybody wants to go to heaven don't nobody want to go to hell tonight that's not the hard part y'all giving up hell for heaven is not the hard part I tell you the hard part of the Christian life is giving up earth for heaven well, the Bible said in the book of Philippians chapter number 3, after we get saved, we are then to set our affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Brother, we're to start looking towards heaven. Uh, if we've been risen with Christ, we're to be raised to set together in heavenly places. Brother, we're to set our affection up yonder and not down here tonight. I wonder, have you surrendered all this evening? Years ago, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere around in there, there was a man named Judson Van Deventer. Judson Van Deventer uh, was an accomplished artist, painter. He had tenure at a school, at a college, and he taught people how to paint. It was his life's goal and ambition and his dream. They said Judson Van Deventer got saved and God started using him, Brother James, uh, uh, in meetings and in different revivals to sing and to help others. God started working on his heart about giving up everything that he had dreamed and lived for giving up his tenure at that college and giving up his dream of painting and going into the ministry whole hog giving him everything Judson Vanderbilt they said struggled at that thing meeting after meeting and week after week and it got to where he didn't even enjoy his painting anymore and didn't even enjoy instructing anymore and they said finally one night Judson Vanderbilt uh, in deep agony and prayer finally throwed up the white flag of surrender and he took a pen and paper and he sat down and wrote these words he wrote all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed savior I surrender all listen to me tonight y'all I'm not asking you to surrender all to the pastor I'm not asking you to surrender all to the church I'm not 
asking you to surrender all to the visiting evangelists or singers. You surrender all to a man and you'll pick it back up again. But if you'll give it all to Jesus uh, and let him have it, he'll keep it for time and eternity tonight. You say, preacher, you preaching on that all that I surrender all business, but why should I? Surrender all. Why should I surrender everything I got to the Lord Jesus Christ? Three little reasons in the text. I see why everyone should surrender all tonight. It is the same three reasons why Ornan surrendered all as well. Can I show you the three reasons and we'll go. Number one, I would like to say you should surrender all because the king requests it. <laughs> you should surrender all just simply because the king requests it. Look at verse 22. Watch the king requesting this field. Verse 22. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me, or give me, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. I believe the first reason why everybody in the building, young and old, male and female, should surrender all to the Lord Jesus is because he has requested it this evening. I can see maybe, maybe, just maybe, after Ornan has given this field up to David, maybe a week, two weeks, a month or two later, maybe Ornan's uptown walking around somewhere. He's in the marketplace. He's conducting his business. And about that time, somebody stops him and says, Ornan, I heard you give your field up up yonder. I heard you don't own it anymore. Why in the world would you give your field up, poor man? That was your daddy's and your daddy's daddy's daddy's. And that's been in your family for way on back. Why would you give your field up, poor man? I mean, that's what feeds your family. That was your threshing floor. You had a lot of pride and work and labor in that field. It was yours. Why did you just let him borrow it? You didn't have to give it to him. I mean, why would you give it up, poor man? And poor man would say, because he asked me to. Yeah. He asked me to. Well, so what? So what if he asked you to? Who is David? What does it matter if he simply asks you to give it up? And Ornan would say, oh, if you say something like that, you must not have ever met my king. Because yeah. <laughs> if you'd ever met my king, you'd know why I'd just give it all to him. Yeah. See, because my king ain't like no other king that you've ever met before. My king's that holy king. My, my, my king's that shepherd king. My king was that anointed king by Samuel. My king's that king that stepped out on a battlefield in 1 Samuel 17. And when everybody had tucked tail and run before a nine foot tall giant, my king's the king that stepped out with a gut full of God and a heart full of the Holy Ghost. And my king's the one that took a rock and a stone and slung it into the head of that big sucker and took him down. My king's the king that is the sweet psalmist of Israel. My king is that king that God's blessing is on us because of him. I tell you why I give it all to him because there ain't no king like my king and he asked for it tonight. And some of y'all sit here and look at me sideways, scratch your head, fold your arms and say, preacher, why should I give it all to Jesus Christ tonight because he asked for it. And if you say, well, who is Jesus? Maybe it's because you never met my king because if you'd ever met my, if you'd ever met my king, you know I just give it all to him. They ain't never been a king like my king. My king ain't just a king. My king's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. They ain't never been another one like him. My king's the one that came from that world to this world. Born in a stable. Lived 33 and a half years of sinless perfection. My king cleansed lepers. My king opened blinded eyes. My king opened deaf ears. My king opened dumb mouths. My king cussed the devils out. My king died on a cross. My king shed perfect blood. My king rose again three days later. My king sits on the throne. My king's coming back to get me. And if you'd ever come in contact, if you'd ever met, if you'd ever come in contact with my king, you'd know why I give it all to him tonight. I really, I really, really, really wonder sometimes if some people that claims to have met him really, really are subjects of His. You see, most people want a Savior, but they don't want a king. Y'all know what a king is? A king is somebody that sticks his nose all up in your business. Americans don't know nothing about kings. 
Americans ain't had kings. America, look here, the last king America had was in the 1770s. We got sick of him, tossed his tea out into the harbor. Amen. Got, grabbed our guns, started a revolution, run him out. Praise God. Yeah, Americans don't know nothing about kings. We free. We independent. But can I say the kingdom of God that if you're saved, you got into and it got in you, it's not a democracy. It's not even a republic. It's a monarchy. It's a monarchy. It's the king running the show. He calls the shots. You don't. He does. All us independent Christians, we don't like the idea of somebody telling us what to do. Well, you start serving Jesus Christ, he's telling you everything to do tonight. Oh, yeah, man, if you ever met him, you just know he's so wonderful. I don't mind giving it all to him because he's wonderful. Ornan does not simply give it up because the king requests it. He also gives it up not just because of who the king is, but he gives it up because of what the king has done for him. You said, what did the king do for Ornan? Oh, he stopped the judgment of God from falling on him. He sure did. Watch what your Bible said. Look, you, you realize the Bible said this down there in verse number 20. Look at verse number 20. It said, Ornan turned back and saw the angel, and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Ornan was threshing wheat. Y'all get this picture in your mind. Here is Ornan, preacher Foster. I mean, brother, he's up there threshing wheat. And about that time, him and his four boys start hearing people screaming and hollering back down yonder in Jerusalem. They look down and they can literally see the angel with the sword uh, hacking people up. I mean, they dying left and right. They, Brother Christian, they screaming and hollering down there. And about that time, as they're watching this with their jaws dropped and their eyes big as 50 cent pieces, about that time, the angel starts walking out of town and up the hill to where Ornan is and his boys. And the Bible said Ornan hid himself. You know why he hid himself? He thought he was next. And he was. Ornan goes, he runs, and he hides behind something, and he thinks, oh God, he's done killed 70,000 Jews. What's five more Jews? Me and my four boys. Ain't no big deal now. We all dead, boys. I love you. But we all fixing to die. It's over for us. But he don't die. Why? Verse number 21. Watch what happens. And as David came to Ornan, Ornan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. You know, you know what stops the judgment of God from falling on Ornan? The king come walking up into his field. <laughs> the king walked up in his field. Y'all, uh, let, me, let me say this to you. God doesn't kill Ornan because of who Ornan is. Who is Ornan? Nobody. I told you he's only mentioned three times and one of the other times he mentioned by a whole other name. He ain't nobody. He ain't nothing. Why does God not kill Ornan? Not for Ornan's sake. Ornan ain't nobody. I'll tell you why I don't kill him. Because of David's sake. Because the Bible said that God gave David his sure mercies. There's something about David. I know what there is about him. He's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's that, he's that one that the Son of God's going to spring uh, root out of Jesse, out of the dry ground, come up from this loins, brother. There's something about this guy the Lord has respect unto. You say, preacher, why should I surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if you're saved, he stood in between you and the judgment of God one day. I tell you why I surrender all to him. Because one night as a teenage boy lost without God and going to hell, that preacher got to preach it, and I I saw my sin exceedingly sinful. I realized I was going to hell without hope, without God. But thank God on that night, the king came walking up into my field, landed on my piece of dirt, and I did what Ornan did. I flung myself at his feet, and the king stopped the judgment of God from falling on me. If the judgment of God has not fallen on you tonight, you can rest assured it's because the king has stood in between you and the judgment of the Father this evening. 
Why should I surrender all? Because the king has requested it. Can I say, secondly, there's another reason why you should surrender all. Secondly, because the cost requires it. There is a cost that requires it. Did you notice verse 22? Watch it with me again. David says to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar there unto the Lord. Watch what he said. Thou shalt grant it me for not half price, not, not, not 25% off, not the good buddy deal. He said, I'm going to give you the full price. Verse 24, verse 24, King David said to Ornan, Nay, but I will verily buy it. He's adamant about this. For the full price. <laughs> David basically says, Ornan, whatever the law requires that I pay for your piece of dirt, whatever the law's demands is, that's what I'll pay for it. Ornan, you find out what the full price is. Whatever the law requires, I must pay for your piece of dirt. I am willing, ready, and able to pay it. I will pay for your little measly piece of dirt, whatever it costs. And can I say, I really believe old David overpaid for it. The Bible said he gave him 600 shekels of gold by weight. That's about a half a million dollars for this little piece of dirt. I mean, he really kind of overpays for what he got. You realize David could have demanded this for nothing? I told you about monarchies, monarchies. We don't understand monarchies. But in this day, if the king wants it, he ain't got to tell you nothing. He ain't got to ask you nothing. He can kick you off of it. He can take it. You say, no, he can't. I beg to differ. Did you not ever read over there about what Ahab did when he wanted that fellow's uh, Naboth's vineyard over there? The Bible said he just killed him and took it. If the king wants it, he can run you off of it just like that. He don't got to pay you a dime for it if he wanted to. But not this righteous king. This righteous king says, I want to fulfill all the jots and the tittles of the law, and I'll pay the full price so that I can own that piece of dirt. You say, preacher, why should I surrender everything I got and everything I am to the Lord? Because He paid for you! You say, what do you mean He paid for me? I say, He paid the full price. The law's demands. You say, preacher, I don't remember this transaction taking place. I don't remember being there when the Benjamins and the Hundos swapped hands one from the other. Preacher, when did this happen? I don't remember. Oh, you wasn't bought with such things as dead presidents on a piece of paper. The Bible said, for as much as you know, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world manifest in these times for you the Bible said this is the law's demands almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission for you to be bought and paid for God had to pay with the most precious commodity that heaven had to offer with the rich red royal redeeming blood of the Lamb of God and he bought you tonight the Bible said in Acts chapter number 20 that God purchased the church with his God's own blood the blood that beat through the heart and coursed through the veins of the lovely Lord Jesus was not the blood of a carpenter named Joseph but it was the blood of a three times holy God come into this world to redeem a fallen race back unto him himself and he paid the ultimate full price tonight what know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which ye have of God check it out and ye are not your own why for ye are bought with a price therefore in light of that fact Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's tonight. Say, so why should I surrender all? Because that price requires it. That cost requires that you give it all to Him. How dare you? How dare you? I said, how dare you, sir or ma'am, 
soak up the good grace and salvation of God to get a get out of hell free card and then after you have thumb your nose at his price that bought you and live any way you want and do whatever you want how dare you that price is not just good enough to keep you out of hell but that price was enough to buy you uh, as his servant to buy you as his child uh, and he demands allegiance out of your life tonight the price <laughs> The cost requires it. Uh, when I think about the cost that Jesus paid for me, when I think of what they did to my Savior, Brother Foster, Brother Jordan, when I think that the night they come and got him, they came in the middle of the night, in the dark of night, and they locked him. I mean, brother, they tied up his hands and smacked him in the face and got him in the dark like he was some sort of common criminal, like he was some sort of thief. When it didn't ever do nothing but help people, give people hope and life and salvation. Drew him off to the high priest's house, and while he was there, they lied on him. And they mocked him, and they slapped him in the face. And if that wasn't enough, they then took him down to Pilate's judgment hall. And they mocked him some more, and they laughed at him some more. And they blindfolded him, and they slapped him in the face, and they plucked the hairs of his beard out. They said, prophesy to us. Who was it that smacked you? And they laughed about it and thought it was funny. They planted a crown of thorns down on his head till the blood rushed off his brow. Uh, they put the purple robe on his bloodied back after they had whipped him unmercifully and flogged him in the Praetorian Hall. They put a reed in his hand. They bowed before him laughing about it and said, oh, you're the king of the Jews, are you? Then they put a cross on his back and he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the skull and he walked up Calvary's dark hill when they got him there they drove nails in his hands and in his feet and they dropped that cross down in the hole and they watched him for six hours as he hung there uh, between heaven and hell suspended died for the sins of all of humanity and after he'd sucked his last breath they shoved the spear in his side till the blood and the water come out then they took him off the cross and chunked him uh, in an unmarked grave uh, uh, look at here that nobody ever laid him before and I look at all that and I think, Lord, you paid way too high a price for what you got. I'll, I'll not speak for none of y'all in here. I'll not speak for none of y'all. You speak for yourself, but y'all listen to me tonight. I know what I am, and when I look in the mirror every day at that sorry, good-for-nothing scallywag that I have to live with every day, and I'm not talking about my wife. I'm talking about me, praise God. Yeah, that's me. I'm the rotten one at the house. I can promise you that. When I look in the mirror, you know what I think? I think, God, you paid way too high a price for what you got. I'm not speaking for none of y'all. Maybe when you look in the mirror, maybe when you look in the mirror, you think, mm -mm. God really got something when he got me. Maybe that's the way you look at yourself. I don't know how you look at yourself. I'm telling you how I look at mine. I look at it and I think, God, what you paid for, you, you didn't get near enough for what you paid for. You didn't get near enough for what you paid for. But he paid it. He paid it gladly. The Bible said he set his face like a flint to the cross. Brother, didn't nobody take his life. He laid it down willingly. Though the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He did it because he loved me this evening. How could I not give him back everything? I'll never forget a story I heard years ago, one of the, one of the greatest illustrations of the grace of God I'd ever heard in my life. I was reading a commentary on the book of Romans, and the author told the story in this commentary back during the days of the Great Depression. Up in New York City, there was a judge that sat on the bench named LaGuardia. They named the airport after him up there. He was respected and revered in New York City. He ended up being mayor and such as that, but at this point, he was sitting on the bench as a judge. He was hearing cases that day, and they brought in a man who had been caught stealing bread in a food shortage in the Great Depression. LaGuardia looked at him, and he said, Sir, the fine for stealing bread is $10 or 30 days in jail. What do you take, and how do you plead? He said, Your Honor, I am guilty. I make no bones about it. He said, Your Honor, I've been laid off of work. I ain't got a job. I've got a wife and family to feed. And your honor, if I, if I had the money, I wouldn't have stole the bread. But I don't got a dime. Just trying my best to get through this, this, this food shortage and this depression. He said, sir, I feel sorry for you. 
But, but the, the fine and the law still demands somebody's got to pay for this. $10 or 30 days in jail, what do you take? He said, sir, I guess I'll take the 30 days in jail. LaGuardia slammed the gavel down, said, bailiff, take him away. And just as they was taking that man out of the courtroom, that man's wife and his little kids was over to the side and started raising a fuss, and them kids started crying, Mama, what are they doing with Daddy and reaching out for Daddy and all that? And old LaGuardia had compassion on that old boy. They said, LaGuardia said, stop, stop. He, he stopped the proceedings and he walked out from around behind the bench and he pulled off his robe of judgment. They said he laid his judging robe to the side. Said he walked up to the bailiff and he pulled his wallet out of his own pocket, grabbed $10 out and paid the man's fine. He walked back up, they said, around behind the bench and put his robe back on and he sued the courtroom $50 for living in a town where a man had to steal bread to feed his family. Then he took up a collection of the people in the courtroom that felt the same compassion and he went and walked out of the courtroom with the money they took up which was $47.50 plus the $50 fine. Walked out free and $97.50 in his pocket. Say, what are you talking about? Say, that's what happened to us one day, friend. We was guilty we was condemned and we deserve what we was going to get. But thank God the King, thank God the King walked up into our life, paid the fine, paid the debt, dropped heaven's glory in our soul. How could we not give him everything back? <laughs> when justice called for a payment for sin, no one worthy could be found among men but the precious sign of God with a cross and thorny crown paid the debt with the blood of the Lamb. Oh, how great was the debt that I owed bound to pay for all them seeds that I had sown. But in Jesus my Lord, a great treasure I have found. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's been paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. Free to live, freed from sin, now I am. And it reads on the page, where my sins were written down Paid in full by the blood of the Lamb Why should I surrender all? The cost requires you to The king requests you to Lastly, I'm done The last reason I believe everybody in the building should surrender all Not just because the king requests it and the cost requires it But lastly, the construction is the reason for it the construction is the reason for it. Say, so what do you mean the construction? Well, God's got plans to put something on this piece of dirt. I told you that, that Ornan's mentioned three times. Can I show you the last place he's mentioned in your King James Bible? Would you go with me to the book of Second Chronicles? Just go to the right, to the next book. Second Chronicles in chapter number 3. Second Chronicles in chapter number 3, and, and I'm done. There's a construction that is the reason for it. Why does God want this piece of dirt? He wants to plant something on it. What I'm about to read to you in Second Chronicles chapter 3 happens 20 years after the event I've been preaching on tonight. 20 years later, this takes place on this piece of dirt. Watch what the Bible said, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse number 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared. Watch where this is at. In the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Solomon is about to erect the greatest structure that has ever been known to mankind on planet earth. This, this building that Solomon is about to create and put here, it is a multi-billion dollar facility. 
Never been another facility like it in magnificence, glory, or honor. The next time something this awesome will be on planet earth, the king of kings will be the one that builds it himself. He'll reconstruct the temple himself when he comes to rule and reign for a thousand years. But until then, there ain't never been nothing like this. And it ain't there now. It's gone, that one is. Solomon's about to build this thing. He's putting it there. Brother, look here. Ornan had the privilege of giving the dirt that the temple sets on to David. And then Solomon got it. 20 years later. 20 years later. Y'all realize 20 years later, Ornan don't just got sons. Ornan's got grandsons. I can see in my imagination that on this day, Ornan is walking uh, uh, along by the base of this threshing floor, this Mount Moriah, and he looks up, and up on top of that place, brother, there, there is the temple. Y'all realize what happened on the day of temple dedication? The Bible said on the day of temple dedication it got on so good up in that place that the cloud of God set down on it. It got on so good they couldn't even minister on the inside. They had to come outside. I can see Ornan walking down at the base of that hill. He's got grandbabies on both hands. Uh, they're walking around and they look up. And they can hear the people shouting and saying glory to God. Bless the good name of the Lord. Hallelujah for the good things of God. That cloud has set down. The power of God's moving all around. And about that time, Ornan looks at them grandbabies and says, Hey, y'all, you see that? I give that to them. I give that to them. They said, Oh, granddaddy, you ain't done it. Yeah, I sure did. I sure did. 20 years ago, the king come by and asked me, Could he have it? And I just give it all to him. And y'all... I want you to look at what God has done with what I gave Him. What I gave God wasn't much. What I gave God was just a little piece of dirt. But look what God has planted on my little piece of dirt. I gave God a piece of dirt. And look what God has put on it for His glory. Say, what are you talking about tonight, preacher? I say, if you'll give God your piece of dirt, lock, stock, and barrel, no strings attached, just let Him have everything, God will plant something on it that brings Him glory and brings Him honor and brings Him praise. God will put something on it that He can get all the praise and the glory for. It, brother, God will put something on it that future generations can see and say, look what God did. You know the problem with a lot of Christians? They want what Ornan got without giving what Ornan gave. Oh, we want God to do something with our dirt. Okay. Give it to him. You got to give it to him. God can't put something on it as long as you still got it. It's got to be, Lord, here it is. It's all yours. Now you do something with it. God, if I keep it in my possession, it ain't going to amount to much. Just going to be a little old dirt threshing floor. But if you'll take it, did you see what God put on what he got? He put a temple on it. You know what the point of the temple was? Fellowship. That Bible said your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God wants fellowship out of your life. Relationship out of your life. God can't put on it what He wants to unless you just let Him have all of it. I'm not talking about salvation tonight. I'm talking about surrender. I'm talking about giving God everything, not just giving God your eternity, giving God your here and now. I wonder, have you surrendered it all to Him? You say, preacher, if I come surrender it all tonight to God, will God immediately start putting something on my life? No, no, no. Did y'all realize how long it took? It was 20 years later. You see, you know what I find out about this walk of surrender? It's not a one-time surrendering. You surrender today, and then you surrender again tomorrow, and then you surrender again the next day, and you surrender again the next day. You see, this place that Ornan surrendered and gave up, that's a place that there's been all kind of sacrifice on for years and years even before Ornan got there. Did y'all notice what the name of that threshing floor was according to 2 Chronicles chapter 3? It said it was in the place of Mount Moriah. I read about a fellow in Genesis chapter 22 that walked up that same hill and took his son Isaac and surrendered him to the Lord. Then I read about Ornan coming along 
and surrender in that same place to the Lord. Then I read about Solomon coming along and surrender in that place to the temple of the Lord. Y'all, it's not a one-time piece of sacrifice on your dirt. It's a regular sacrifice and a regular surrender of over and over God. It's yours. I wonder, can he have it? Brother Daniel, would you help me over here? Give us whatever, whatever you think is appropriate. I wonder tonight, would you be willing to say, Lord, I surrender it all to you. Lord, you paid the price for it. God, your cost more than requires that I surrender it all. You have requested that I surrender it all. And God, I want you to put something on it that gives you glory. I look around at the place where we stand at tonight. Brother Daniel, looking around this beautiful facility and these wonderful people that's in here, you know what I see when I look around this place? I see, I, I see that years ago, some people surrendered. A man of God surrendered and some people got behind him and surrendered. Now look what God has done. And I wonder if you'd be willing tonight to say, Preacher, I want him to have it all. Not just part of it, I want him to have all of it. Does he have it? Does he have it? Just give it all to him. I give it all. Let's all stand tonight. Father, I pray that you'd bless the simple message from the Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach your Word. I pray that you'd use it in the hearts and lives of your people. Maybe there's somebody here tonight that's never taken the first step of surrender and being born again. be a good night to do it. God, I pray that you'd help this church. Bless Brother Foster and his family. Help them keep surrendering all. In Jesus' name, amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.